Yeah. 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 Larry Oaks and Don Robinson, thank you so much for coming on your pleasure. Yeah. Cecil Giscom with Jane Gregory. I'm, uh, I curate the, uh, the Fall Holloway series. Welcome to the continuation of uh, continuation of, of Chiku Redding, Reddy's visit to uh, visit to Berkeley. Glad to have you here, sir. Uh, Daniel Benjamin will introduce our first reader, Ishmael Mohammed, and uh, and then Adam Ahmed. We recently saw as a stagehand, will introduce uh, <laughs> Chiku Reddy. So, uh, Daniel, if you could come. Thank you. Hi. I'm so excited and honored to be introducing Ishmael Muhammad this evening. I'm Ishmael's friend and colleague here in the English department. In addition to his fiction, which we will hear tonight, Ishmael is writing a dissertation on the construction and deconstruction of black personality around the middle of the last century, focusing on how, focusing on how literary texts by black authors model unstable subjectivities that offer forms of resistance to a certain formation of the subject. In the more than three years that I've now known Ishmael, I can't remember when I didn't know that Ishmael was a writer. It seems to me that I've always been learning from Ishmael how to be a writer. For Ishmael, that is a certain desirous collaborative movement, where in being together, we can turn ourselves into antennae that are always reaching out to touch new and better ways of being. Ishmael is a Los Angeles writer who is still most interested in the generativity of walking around the city. To be a walker in LA is to move in idiosyncratic opposition to the dominant organization of sociality. Ishmael refuses to credit the rationality of such order. He refuses to believe that suffering is necessary. Ishmael's writing makes a map of the city where the, alley, where the alleys are no less beautiful than the boulevards. This writing insists on dwelling in the delicate spaces between and around. It finds a metaphysics in the non-event. Ishmael is a writer of prose. I thought about using this introduction to claim him for poetry. But that might require me to define what I think poetry is and isn't, which feels like a dangerous undertaking. Except in naming poetry's unacknowledgement, its enacting of the open secret, its refusal to be named. I think it is no stretch to say that Ishmael's prose writings have the unstable fecundity and resistance to closure that we identify with poetry. But ultimately, I don't care that much about the distinction between poetry and what isn't poetry, Except that I think in Ishmael's case, we ought to let these stories be stories. I think Ishmael is wrong about some things, like his low opinion of Drake's verse in Diamond's Dancing. Um, but here I think we should follow him. As Ishmael writes, would they have said it like we do? Maybe that's more productive. And Ishmael also writes, I got to enjoy myself around the city in a particular way she never could. Please join me in welcoming Ishmael Muhammad. Can you guys hear me? Uh, um, thank you to Cecil and um, to, for organizing uh, this reading. Thank you for Ch uh, to Chiku for coming, um, and to Larry and Don for, for playing for us. Um, I'm going to read some stories for you um, tonight about um, four. Um, I'm going to start with one called 13 Ways, which um, began as a, a Wallace Stevens joke um, a long time ago. Um, around the time Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, I've been working on it for uh, about four years now. Um, I don't have all the 13 ways written yet, so I'll give you the first six that I, that I have written um, that I'll have to do for now. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is 13 ways, an occasional story. One, it was Beverly Hills in the summer. And so of course they sat at marble tables beneath their restaurant awnings with their heels tapping on cracked concrete. They were 20 people, customers, who appeared as naturally occurring objects, 
fixtures of the landscape. They looked so comfortable. Even when they moved, they were unmoving, like the ruins of, of a bridge that's collapsed into the river. From the kitchen, an eye in exile flitted from face to face, the only moving thing. Two. He has learned to operate as a leather mechanic in a field of leather straps clenched in alarm at his presence. Between two fields where his body is continuous, with caressing fingers, with leather grips, with a sustained swollenness if he is lucky, with silver sleep penetration if he is not, circulating around three fields where pronouncing ask the right way can make all the difference, where pronouncing acts the wrong way can make all the difference, where giving up and not pronouncing ask at all can make all the difference. Three, loving hands are for mashing sweet potatoes and cinnamon and vanilla and butter because cake beaters leave that metallic trace and also because when those same hands knead dough for, for dinner rolls, it is a transfer and trace of cinnamon that one desires. Four, he knows better than to consider himself one with any man or woman and would not desire anything like that. But you can be sure that if you've seen him in a room, he has already seen you and has made, is making, has always made, will make the necessary adjustments. Five. This life has become a matter of breathing out taking in, touching upon, sliding along, bumping against, curling around, slipping between, latching onto, lapsing into, innuendo. Uh, six. For them his body was a miracle, capacious enough to accommodate anything they might want to insert. He could absorb anything, and no insertion was too barbaric. In certain lights, they even detected the beginnings of a pleasure that veiled his face. A true miracle of that body. Though, when it was gone, it did not occur to them to wonder how they ever got along without it. Um, the rest is to be continued. Uh, this next one is called Avoided, um, which I wrote a, a while ago. Also, around the time of Trayvon Martin's death. Um, what did they say? It is impossible to know what they said. Would they have said it like we do? Maybe that's more productive? How to say blood spilled from pop flesh, blood spilled from gone limbs, dried blood from voided flesh? We can't say. There was this bell in my family's living room for the longest, longest time. Mom said it was, it was from a plantation, and I believed because it was rusty. Rust says truth, right? When I was bold, I would reach out to the piano where it sat and ring it, but I could not look over my shoulder afterwards. Never look over your shoulder afterwards. This is the last uh, short piece. Um, it's either titled Skyline or, or No Shadow or maybe just Untitled. Um, that summer, Emily and I were always walking Santa Monica from La Cienega to Vermont because there wasn't much better to do. We'd weave in and out of pedestrian traffic position ourselves so the German tourists could batter us with their ridiculous backpacks, glide up against the other kids so their sweat could mingle with ours, let the homeless men graze our fingers when they accepted our money. At night, we'd let the women reach out to caress us, caress our arms as they walked by. We'd anticipate their touch when they emerged out of alleys or subway exits and shiver at the feeling. 
practiced fingers playing jokes on our skins. It was usually the same few women every night, taking shifts. They stopped us for conversation, told us their names, called us their babies, their regulars, warned us off the boulevard, and seemed a little sad once we left. They were like us. We just wanted to get touched, to fill our bodies in space, to turn ourselves into antennae. We had so few chances for that in real life, or maybe just hadn't found the right ones. We needed other people to reveal ourselves to ourselves. So that summer, we were always walking Santa Monica from La Cienega to Vermont. But Emily was rich, or rather her family was rich. My family, my family was rich too, though I did not or could not realize that until I went to college, and my black friends sneered at me for studying English. But no, Emily's family and my family were rich in different ways. Because when I say she was rich, I know, and I think you know, what's really meant is that Emily was white, which is, of course, another way of saying she got to enjoy herself around the city in a particular way I never could, which is, of course, still another way of saying that I got to enjoy myself around the city in a particular way she never could. She liked hurling herself at people. This was back before we learned that hurling oneself at anyone was sure to end in tears. But back then, she loved it, and so she did it. It was nothing for her to launch herself at the Germans, let her body fall through space in pure exaggeration, to escape through and into pure exaggeration. At that right time, at the right time, at that peculiarly LA time, when the sun obliterates all dark, she can make it so that her body cast no shadow. I'm going to read one more um, honest to God story, um, a love story. Um, of someone coming to California. I wrote it like probably a month after I moved to Berkeley um, a long time ago. So. Karen went to California to find him, but found the equivalent of a house with his door kicked in and owners disappeared. On the back of a postcard he sent her, his last note address seemed so promising. Printed neatly as it was in his way, the handwriting so uniform that it might have been typed. This address seemed trustworthy. He could not have indicated a desire to be found and persuaded more clearly. In a rented car, she drove down Telegraph Avenue to an Oakland apartment. It sat lured above a noisy pizza joint. Karen decided that the chipped paint and rusty balcony and screen door half off its hinges could not belong to the same world he walked in. Still, parked across the street with a clear view of the apartment's entrance, she hunched over the wheel and watched. She could be persuaded. Two hours passed, the sun set, no lights came on in the apartment. She drove back to her Berkeley motel. Biker's tail lights flashed in her eyes as she drove back up Telegraph, and she learned that this absence was a good thing. It would have been heartbreaking to find, to find him there, of all places. The notion of him in California was bad enough. Center Man came on the radio. She circled the motel until the song was done. Pulling into the parking lot, she found it as empty as it had been in the afternoon. Giant Steps came on, and that was good, too. There was nothing wrong with falling asleep in her car. There was no one to offend besides herself. The wool coat he bought for her birthday seemed ludicrous in the warm December air, but she pulled it, pulled it over her face anyway, with Coltrane playing savior in the delicate space between her head and the dashboard. She woke up some hours later. The sun was barely up, but she made out the small Indian landlady's landlady standing across the parking lot, hands cupped over her eyes. She looked worried, not angry. Her sari was vaguely stained with mustard or early morning sun. Karen wanted very badly to take it and wash it, but couldn't bring herself to exit the vehicle. Still, she was touched. Parking lot concrete looked naked and especially gray without cars parked over it, she observed. 
It was two days after Christmas. Only a handful of people moved up and down shattered, sometimes in groups, but mostly alone. Homeless men and women lined the sidewalks but had no one to beg. No matter how early Karen left the motel, the homeless were always out first. They were a natural feature of the, feature of the landscape, predictable as the morning fog. The sky matched the gray of their, of their washed out denim vest. Karen sat at the downtown Berkeley Bart stop, observing one young woman walk circles around a trash receptacle. She tried to feel fascinated, but mostly felt sad. The girl's eyes were set in permanent shock. Her hair was tangled and unwashed. Her pace was brisk, but she had somewhere to be, and the promise of arrival always lay around the next curve. On one of her trips around the trash receptacle, the girl almost made eye contact. This man, Karen, suggested similarities. She abandoned her perch soon after. The apartment looked much the same the next afternoon. Karen chose a different parking spot, hoping it would yield a different result. Karen had gotten used to the metaphysics of the non-event. It was the hope that mattered. She imagined herself capable of staring through the chipped exterior into the occupant's life. This, of course, never came to fruition, but it was the imagining she enjoyed the most. After an hour, a bespectacled, hairy-looking woman appeared on the balcony, clutching a filthy cat. The sun glinted off her thick bifocals, but her cardigan was dingy. The cat clawed absently at the fabric and tore a hole in it, but the woman did not notice. Karen was too busy finding this woman distasteful and by the time she realized they were staring into each other's eyes, she had no way of extricating herself from the interaction. Karen felt her time in California coming to a close. She imagined the faint scent of ammonia, of cat piss, and decided he could not have lived at that address. Thank you. pleasure to introduce Shiku Reddy, a poet whose work is ongoing proof of the possibility of a world carried in and beyond our own impossible one. He is the author of four books of poetry, Facts for Visitors, published in 2004, Voyager, published in 2011, Conversities, uh, in collaboration with uh, Daniel Beachy Quick, and uh, Readings in World Literature, both of which were published in 2012. He's also a professor of English at the University of Chicago and the author of a 2012 critical work titled Changing Subjects, Digressions in Modern American Poetry, a work that traces the centrality of digression within modernist and contemporary American poetics. In his reading of poetic di digression alongside and against post-structuralist accounts of knowledge production, Reddy shows that digression is not only a formal feature of certain 20th and 21st century works, but the very condition of any poetry that can be called contemporary. It's habitation and evasion of normative conditions that structure it, and it's making of alternative subjects and worlds. Like his critical work, the ruinous world of modernity forms the backdrop for Reddy's resuscitation of poetry's ancient and ongoing song. Existing somewhere between necromancy and archaeology, Reddy's poetic work is, sustained, is a sustained study in the citational and iterative quality of the voice, the way in which words gather and repeat voices and silences in their enunciations. We encounter one such voice in the poem Corruption from Facts for Visitors, when the speaker begins by telling us that he will reiterate, quote, I am about to recite a song that I know. Before I begin, my expectation extends over the entire song. Once I have begun, the words I have said remove themselves from expectation and are now held in memory, while those yet to be said remain waiting in expectation. The present is a, is a word for only those words which I am now saying." End quote. 
The voice here, as in many of Rennie's poems, gets caught in a loop of predications that predicate it. At the same time that it asserts its presence, its presence seems to emerge from some place or time outside of the actual utterance of the voice, a place where it may catalog its unarticulated words in a separate song. In that beyond of speaking, the voice is able to say what it doesn't say with as much authority as it would saying it. But the voice is a def defamiliarized one. Its lyric intonations are learned and borrowed from languages that seem to deny intimacy. Encyclopedias, travel books, political memoirs, scholarship, course descriptions, in trying to situate themselves in their worlds, ready speakers employ and find themselves employed by the authoritative and imperialistic voice of knowledge, a metonymic and archival voice, which Foucault describes as, quote, a particular vacant place that may be filled by different individuals. Ready's poems permit us to see the point at which particularities are evacuated at the same time that they archive a ghostly song in redaction. In a moment from Readings of World Literature, a prose poetic work that indexes, among other things, a failed translation and the disappointment of a humanities required world literature course, the speaker's reading of a fragmented underworld scene in Gilgamesh digresses into the knowledge of the irrecoverability of, Babylon, of the Babylonian underworld within a military-occupied Iraq. An, utter, an unutterable song is accumulated through holes in the speaker's reconstruction of the world, of the world epic, only to be effaced again in the speaker's imaginary course description on introductions to the underworld. A description which reduces that incommensurable knowledge to fact. Quote, the goals of the course are to acquaint students with the posthumous regimes which entrench the division of humankind in perpetuity and to help them develop communication skills that are crucial for success in today's global marketplace. At the same time that Reddy's work traces the voices that make particularities vacant, he is also sensitive to the way that an utterance may carry other worlds and underworlds. In Voyager, the erasure of a memoir by Kurt Valheim, a UN Secretary General who is exposed as a former Nazi intelligence officer, gives voice to a world that Valheim's political voice elides, a world in which, quote, fact is the script of the unknown, end quote. In the opening lines of the poem, for example, a voice utters, quote, the world is the world. To, to deny it is to break with reason. Nevertheless, it would be reasonable to question the affair. The speaker studies the world to determine the extent of his troubles. He says, therefore, he says, venerable art. To believe in the world, a person has to quiet thinking. The dead do not cease in the grave. The world is water falling on a stone." End quote. Like the speaker of corruption, the voice here seems preoccupied with predication, producing a litany of seemingly unconditional conditions for its existence, a list that is not too, too far off from our current ge geopolitical designations of the world. But in defining the world around them, in stating what is, these detached lines form a countersign, an incantation for the dead taken from a scene of their effacement. Poetry here finds a world in the ruin of the world. It finds a voice that mourns and a voice that denies loss. This is what poetry has always done, but it bears repeating, which is to say, it bears renewing, for an old world we find repeated in the present. Please join me in welcoming Chiku Reddy. generous, thank you. Um, and uh, thanks Larry and Donald and Ishmael. It's really an honor to, um, uh, to be uh, with you all tonight. Uh, thanks for coming. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Okay. 
I'm going to read, uh, I'll try and keep it to um, about 30, not much more than 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to read from a new book called uh, Underworld Lit uh, that um, it's grown out of uh, a chapbook that uh, Rusty Morrison uh, published with Omni Don recently. Um, so there's some echoes with that. It's a long poem in three parts. I'm not going to say much about it. Um, uh, there's a fall term, a winter term, a spring term. Um, and I'll jump around. It's, it's quite a long poem, so I don't know if it'll really work uh, to read it, but I'm going give, to give it a try. Um, um, yeah, so I won't say anything else um, except um, any uh, resemblance to persons uh, historical and real is purely coincidental. <laughs> Uh, so this is fall term. One. In the inky, dismal, and unprofitable research of a recent leave of absence from the middle of my life, I came across an inscription on a historical prism of Ashurbanipal that I found to be somewhat disquieting. Of an enemy whose remains he had abused in a manner that does not bear repeating here. This most studious and exacting of Mesopotamian kings professes, I made him more dead than he was before. Prisms of this sort were often buried in the foundations of government buildings and therefore intended to be read by gods, but not men. Somewhere in the maze of carols and stacks, I thought I could hear a low dial tone humming without end. In Ashurbanipal's library, there's a poem written on clay that corrects various commonly held errors regarding the world of the dead. Pace, Madame Blavatsky, Odysseus, Mulian, and Quasi Benefo et al. It is not customarily permitted to visit the underworld. No, the underworld visits you. Four. Already it's beginning to seem that I cannot avoid the subject of this nation's interminable abuse of another's remains. But I've preferred to write something along the lines of a poetic essay on comparative underworlds. For the past few years, I've taught a course titled Underworld Literature, which has frequently proven to be a disappointment both to myself and to the students, some in headscarves, some occasionally dressed in fatigues, who've registered for this seminar in order to satisfy their humanities requirement. It confirmed my hatred of epics and reaffirmed my faith that I will never study ancient literature. <laughs> the instructor is fairly intelligent and enthusiastic about his brand of writing but is unreceptive, even intolerant, of anything that is not a poem, or a poem in prose form. <laughs> Made me question things, including the value of higher learning. <laughs> it occurred to me that by writing about teaching, I might learn something. There would be assignments, a midterm, and a final examination followed by a series of time detonations and the inward collapse of an abandoned complex under stars. I needed to find my fine footing in the order of things. And because I know almost nothing about the world, I decided to work my way up from below. Five, Hume 101, Introduction to the Underworld, cross the with Complex. In this course, students will be ferried across the river of sorrow, subsist on a diet of clay, weigh their hearts against a feather on the infernal balance, and ascend a viewing pagoda in order to gaze upon their homelands until emptied of all emotion. Texts will include the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Mayan Book of the Dead, the Ethiopian Book of the Dead, and Muriel Rukeyser's Book of the Dead. 
The goals of the seminar are to introduce students to the posthumous disciplinary regimes of various cultures and to help them develop the communication skills that are crucial for success in today's global marketplace. <laughs> All readings in English. Requirements include the death of the student, an oral <laughs> lamentation, and a final paper. <laughs> Six. I promised my wife that I would call Dr. Song today. After putting the baby down for her nap and slipping outside for a smoke, I lifted the receiver. The sound it emitted, which I've heard without pause countless times before, seemed to me otherworldly now, like somebody's finger playing on the wet rim of a crystal bowl in a derelict theater before the wars. I can't say how long I stood there listening. It may have been seconds seasons. The rings of Saturn kept turning in their groove. For reasons beyond me, my unit on Dante wasn't scheduled until the following quarter. I doubt 1-800 Inferno. And before the first ring, a woman's voice answered in heavily accented English. Is it you? I think so, I replied. Outside my window, the honey locusts sprinkled their pale spinning leaves. Focusing on one as it fell seemed to slow the collective descent. O oh, creature, gracious and good, traversing the dusky element to visit us who stained the world with blood, the woman recited, as if reading against her will from a prepared text. I could hear rain trickling in a gutter spout on the other end of the line. Please remove my name from your list, I said, and return the receiver to its cradle. Eight. While outlining the requirements for our first critical essay of the term, I notice a hand rising tentatively in the classroom's farthest corner. What if I'm ideologically opposed to revision asks the red-headed boy in a new slave's t-shirt. A city bus unloads its pageantry just outside the window. A handful of sparrows erupts from the equestrian statue on the quad. I remember Sun Tzu's advice to humanities instructors, which I review on index cards on the eve of each new term. Hold out baits to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. <laughs> what, what exactly is your ideology, I ask, mentally stroking my beard. I'm a Zen next light crypto objectivist, replies my interlocutor. How about you? Removing a stray bran flake lodged in my beard, I have no choice but to improvise. Pro-recycling? Anti-genocide? A voice from beyond my peripheral vision says, you're nothing but a pseudo-Kantian neoliberal mirage with meta-narcissistic tendencies. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Uh, so uh, this narrator um, starts to translate an old Chinese uh, tale, um, which Adam mentioned uh, from, uh, and it's, the, the story actually exists, but only in French, in a French translation, so it's not in English. Um, so as he, and he's gonna use this story in uh, his course, but he makes a lot, his French isn't very good, and he makes a lot of mistakes, you'll see. Uh, and then it starts to take off a, a bad life of its own. This is the beginning. Ten. In the district of Hu Chu Fu, the magistrate's assistant Chen was taking a nap in his study. Suddenly, a motorized airport staircase appeared and beckoned him to follow. It led Chen down a path hidden by rustling thickets of bamboo to a clearing where, on a high pedestal, an enormous mirror waited in the spotlight, in the moonlight. 
Regard what you once were in your previous life, said the motorized stairport air case, staircase. Looking into the mirror, Chen saw a man in, in a tasseled cap and scarlet shoes, dressed like a scholar from the recent past. Now see what you were in the life before that one. Rubbing his eyes, Chen looked again and saw a high official in old Ming costume, black cap, red dragonfly robe, belt with jade buckle, black boots. Just then, a disheveled servant rushed into the clearing, prostrated himself before Chen, and exclaimed, Don't you recognize me? I was your valet in Tatung Fu, but of course that was over 200 years ago. With that said, he handed Chen a scroll. What's this? Chen asked dreamily. Voi si, the servant replied. So Chen learns from the scroll that he's uh, being summoned to the underworld to answer for some uh, war crimes that he committed in a, in a previous life. Um, you know, that could happen to anyone here, really. <laughs> um, but he, he pops up again. Twelve. Our nanny called in sick yesterday. And our nanny called in sick today, and I stayed home with the baby, watching a tree squirrel tuck twigs and trash into her wreck of a nest outside the kitchen window, instead of working on my translation. I love eyebrows, announced Mira, crumpling her bib. I love napkins. I love upstairs. On the radio, a woman with a Northern Irish accent described efforts to restore various archaeological sites in and around the provincial capital of Al-Hilat, where the ancient Mesopotamian city of Babylon once stood. Speaking through an interpreter, a government official described how the 2,600-year-old paving stones of the ancient city's processional way had been crushed under the treads of M1 Abrams tanks. A heliport had been constructed in the ruins. The remains of a ziggurat, which some scholars believe may be the original site of the Tower of Babel, however, appeared to be largely intact for the time being. I love flowers. I love fire, Mira continued. I love foreheads, too. At some point in the day, Dr. Song left me a message. Later that evening, I looked in the bathroom mirror to see if I could detect any trace of infractions from a previous life. All I could make out was the chipped and tarnished surface of the mirror itself, flickering almost imperceptibly. I looked again. This time, to my relief, I saw a man dressed like a scholar from the recent past. Vintage cardigan, thinning hair, an untenured affect of worry beyond repair. I love forks. I love flags. I love shoelaces, too. Thirteen. Upon hearing his tale, affairs from long ago began to infiltrate Chen's memory, although in a disordered and cloudy fashion. He thanked his old retainer. A passing dragonfly landed on his sleeve. Would you prefer to travel on foot or by some other means, inquired the motorized airport staircase, bowing almost imperceptibly. Whoever heard of a high functionary trudging about on foot, protested the cadaver's valet, already beginning to fade around the edges. Ascending the scuffed metal steps, Chen bid his servant farewell. After a journey of many leagues, the staircase arrived at a red river moving slowly through jungle. Two boys swam against the current, their heads dipping in and out of view. From his motorized perch, Chen noted how their blowguns helped them stay afloat. He could see clouds of butterflies suspended above the leafy canopy on the far shore. Up to this point in his travels, Chen had marveled at his expeditious conveyance, which traversed mountains and deserts alike, 
without any action on his part. But now, he protested in vain as the infernal contra contraption sped into the river's shallows. Chen waved to the boys midstream, calling for assistance. Out of earshot, they waved back. The staircase pushed on through the deepening flow. As the waters rose around him, Chen's soaked robes grew impossibly heavy, dragging the former assistant magistrate down, down, into the crimson flux. The last thing he remembered was his mouth filling with blood, which he sensed, somehow, wasn't his own. So Chen goes on an de unexpected detour into the uh, Mont ancient Mayan underworld, and uh, some bad things happen to him there, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, 14. Please print clearly and remember your name. One, the river of fire in ancient Greek thanatopography feeds into the river of blank. Their quiz is in the book. <laughs> two, from the river of pain spring two rivers, the river of blank and the river of blank. <laughs> Three, the river of blank runs a separate course entirely concealed inside the Greek word for truth. Four, at the sight of sinners approaching, the blank seethes like butter in a frying pan. Five, blank is the Sanskrit river of ash. Six, as the sun god Ra floats down the river of the hidden chamber, his head is exchanged for that of a blank. Seven, those for whom much lamentation is made find the blank swollen with tears and difficult to cross. Eight, to our knowledge, the river of blank has no name. Fifteen, melanoma, from the ancient Greek verb melino, to blacken, condemned, can, combined with the nominalizing suffix ma, which indicates process or action. Hence, pragma, action or occurrence, from prato, to do, or poema, poem, from poieo, to make. These days, it seems obligatory for survivors' narratives to muse upon the etymologies of their various illnesses and medical treatments. It lends grandeur to the experience of leafing through Red Book in an empty examination room while dressed in a paper gown that won't draw closed around the back. But I can't refrain from wondering at how a description, black, becomes an action to blacken, which in turn becomes a thing, melanoma, a darkening. There's a whole grammar and metaphysics to this black traffic. The root may be traced to the Sanskrit mala, dirt or filth, and flowers into our modern English melancholy. 16. The odds are good, Dr. Song tells me in his office. Still, he blinks too much as he answers my wife's questions about this perplexing case. Melanoma is exceedingly rare among individuals of my dusky extraction and virtually non-existent among younger members of this population. You're a medical miracle, choked one nurse before I went under, but not the good kind. At least my tests show no spread to the neighboring lymph nodes, lowering the mortality rate within three years to roughly one in 10. Not bad odds. I resolve not to make too much of this matter in the days to come. But the complimentary brochure that I take from the rack as I exit the reception area says I mustn't make too little of it either. In this respect, my condition is not unlike the war. I don't want to make too much of it in my ambient transactional order. But I don't want to make too little of it either.
I will skip ahead uh, to win, uh, read just a few sections from winter and spring terms. This is, these are from winter term. One. I kind of like it with those guys. <laughs> they're, into, they're into it. <laughs> One. Jung Wook An, Dada Hadamik, Vidu Jayasuriya, Anakleta Liriano. Outside, the first snow of the winter session descends so softly it seems to fall upward. I sound out the syllables on my attendance sheet in philological time. Though the names are unfamiliar, I can't shake the sense that I'm always already repeating myself at the start of each new term. It helps to compare things, I begin unsteadily, to see where you stand in the world. My classroom observer, dispatched by the Center for Faculty Excellence in the wake of last quarter's scurrilous student evaluations, <laughs> glides in like a shadow against the far wall. Anyone who studies the region of unlikeness is a comparatist, I continue, trying not to lose my place. A skate punk clatters through the doorway. A Razzi grunt unzips his rock sack under the seminar table. Turning back to my notes, I discover I've lost my place. Mm -hmm. To compose a simile, you need a tenor and a vehicle, I say, skipping blindly ahead. Can somebody give me a tenor? Enrico Caruso volunteers a Latina band girl with an applique treble clef line ironed on to her cardigan. Okay, sure, why not, I say, demonstrating my commitment to student-directed learning outcomes. <laughs> and a vehicle? Le Car intones an unshaven auditor with an incurable Quebecois accent. Excellent, I chirp. That's what I'd call excellent student participation. <laughs> My observer frowns at her fingernails. In oversized script, I emblazon the blackboard. Enrico Caruso is like a lacar. There is a brief period of universal scribbling. <laughs> the classroom's radiators pound out an alien meter. Ancient pipes whistle an atonal ostinato under the floorboards. Enrico Caruso is like a lacar, an ESL poster boy carefully enunciates. Enrico Caruso is like a lacar, mutters my observer, consulting her clipboard. Enrico Caruso is like a lacar, beatboxes a redhead in dreadlocks. I surrender myself to the emergent classroom dialectic. <laughs> All together now. <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm just going to read one more section from this middle part. Uh, Chen um, go, ends up delivering a baby in, a, uh, unfit, in ancient Egypt, <laughs> uh, in a, inside of an abandoned, an unfinished pyramid. Um, so this is the scene. He's delivering a baby. The mother's name is Nef. Uh, and um, the pyramid is open to the sky, so this reference to this oculus up above. Um, and uh, there's a boat in this scene. It's a fun the kind of funerary barge that you would find inside of uh, Egyptian tombs of the period. What else? Oh, also there's sometimes translator notes start to pop up, so there's a little translator note I'll, I'll mark it for you. 31. Dawn, with her frosted pink fingernails, raked away night's remains. Migrating egrets traverse the brightening oculus. Here and there, Chen could make out pointless colonies of wildflowers sprinkled around the verdant edge. Cradling the baby in her arms, Neff climbed onto the solar boat. She propped herself against the curved prow and patiently wrangled the child fussing at her breast. The infant's flailing hand grasped a miniature oar and began to roll, row. Oh, Sudi, cooed the girl. Be good. They looked like a surrealist parade float, or a lost scene from Gulliver's Travels, 
or a girl nursing her baby on a scale model funeral vessel. But somehow, everything fell into proportion. Only the cataract of blood trickling over the ship's gunwale spoiled the illusion. What's that? Chen cried out. Neff frowned thoughtfully at her lap. I don't know, she said, beginning to shiver. I thought it was over. The umbilicus tethering her to the baby pulsed weakly, then stopped. Chen reached up and tugged at the slippery cord as if it were a bit of loose rigging. Ouch! Nefsh screeched. Don't do that. Never, under any circumstances whatsoever, pull the cord. Trans. A scarlet puddle had formed on the masonry around Pet Chen's feet. Neff doubled over, clutching the baby to her chest. Pulling himself up on tiptoe, Chen peered over the edge of the deck and watched a venous lump spill out from the girl like a cadaver decomposition island ex situ ab ovo postscriptum in gynecological space time. Twins, he squeaked. He's had some bad experiences with twins in another underworld. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Ugh, Neff said, breathless. It's the afterbirth. It's nothing. It's over, Ching. Christ. Chen scooped up the bloody rema remainder in one hand. With the other, he fumbled for the travel-sized stainless steel scissors in his trousers. Sunrise flooded the unfinished pyramid. For a heartbeat, Chen felt like a deathless god upholding the balance. May I? he asked, bowing deeply. A passing dragonfly landed on the ornamental rudder. Thanks, Neff said, reaching for the scissors. I think I'll take it from here. Okay, so I'll just read a f maybe a, a few more sections from the spring, uh, a spring term. Uh, so the narrator of the book uh, keeps finding copies of his own last book uh, in the campus used bookstore. <laughs> um, and they're in each copy is inscribed to a different person who he thought kind of, you know, uh, liked him. Um, <laughs> and so he's just found another copy of his book for the third time. Uh, and this one he'd inscribed to his oncologist song. And now he has a medical appointment with some. Four. I'm here for my follow-up, I announced, drumming my fingers on the counter. I have an appointment. Since my last visit, some campus wag with a sharpie has doctored the C on the oncology wall plaque into a T. Water drips from the ceiling and forms a Stygian pool at my feet. The waiting area has seen better days. So have the patients. I'm sorry, says the receptionist, blinking. The doctor can't see. This isn't the first time I've had to reschedule with Song. Fumbling for my planner, I scowl at the receptionist. Maybe it's just deja vu, but she looks strangely familiar. Hold on, I say, digging around in my satchel. Weren't you in disorienting Asian American poetry a few years back? Actually, it was Poetics of Erasure, she murmurs, blushing. I didn't think you'd remember. I nod sagely, though I can't put a name to the face. George? Fadi? Rita? Neff? Across the room, a black woman with red eyes swats at her toddler with a rolled up golf digest. <laughs> I don't teach that class anymore, I say, rubbing my chin. I guess I've moved on. Work set with Zedidabum, Iraq Puba. Now and then, a distorted voice calls out patient names in an infernal accent over the intercom. Vincent is Axel. An unshaven man in a papery gown wheels up beside me, cradling a plastic bag half full of urine. I'm a hopeless optimist, I suppose. For all I know, 
he may see the bag as half empty. <laughs> My wife told me to take that line out. <laughs> um, so what times do you have open, I asked, consulting my planner. I've got a score to settle with song. Discuss long-term prognosis, my planner reads. Then a little pop quiz on the book. I probably shouldn't be telling you this, my former pupil in tones, Sato Voce. Arching an eyebrow, she leans over the counter. Song's dead. Sorry? Suicide, I hear. Mm. Oh, I say, bracing myself on the counter. I see. An access of molecular dust floods my system. I feel like an ink blot reborn as an auto decapitated death got on the planet after this one. For reasons beyond me, I bow deeply. <laughs> I've already said too much, whispers my former pupil. She who enters the data, pass without honors, hate death, law, whose name will forever escape me. A supervisor emerges from a door concealed in the wall. May I schedule an appointment with another physician? My informant resumes an administrative demeanor. please. I nod slowly. She frowns at something on the other side of the screen. Let's see. I might be able to squeeze you in for a quickie with Dr. Who. <laughs> I'll just read one more section. Um, yeah. Maybe two more sections. One quiz and then the last section. Um, so, 26. Rate the posthumous disciplinary measures on the pain scale below. Zero feels no pain at all. Five hurts as much as you can imagine, though you don't have to actually be crying to feel this way. One, masturbate forever, chanting, I am alone in Middle Persian. <laughs> and so I actually put the little smiley face and frowning face pain scale in there. Thought I should show you that. Um, two, contemplate your moral form in the Jade Emperor's mirror. Three, dig through a hill with your breasts, wearing a millstone for a cap. No talking, no bathroom breaks. Hurry up, please. Four, be thou a deathless thorn tree in the suicidal woods. Five, shit forever. Six, hold up the sky. Uh, and then summer is just one section, I'll just read that. Summer. Um, so, you know, um, the, the guy's been kind of uh, planning a camping trip for the whole um, uh, book, but um, Indian people don't really camp. <laughs> and so they end up just camping in the backyard of their house. <laughs> Summer term. My wife pounds the last spike into the earth. On my knees, I blow into the undersized valve with everything I've got, but a little more air leaks out each time. Inflating portable sleep systems in perpetuum, that's the underworld detail in store for me. For the umpteenth time, more or less, I vow to stop smoking before summer's end. Let me do that, says my wife, waving me away. Our tent glows with sunset beyond her, like a sky lantern about to lift off. Make yourself useful somehow? Go on. Be creative. I spread a wool blanket over the patchy grass. Now and then, a soft breeze trails an inkling of lilacs from the neighbor's garden. A dragonfly whirs over the dividing wall, taking the scenic route to the extinction after this one. Good night, dragonfly. Good night, lilacs. The monkeys make sorrowful noise overhead. This is just like camping, Mira says, crawling out of the tent with Hop Hop tucked under her arm. 
isn't it? I'd imagine, I reply. For the record, I've never before slept under the, store, the stars. If I last through the night, my cumulative sentence, I sense, just might be commuted to life without parole. Night, night, pop, pop. My daughter assumes the corpse position beside me. Mission accomplished, my wife announces, claiming a spot on the blanket. She breaks into a crooked smile. It's a one-way valve, by the way. You really are something else. On the contrary, I correct her, hands clasped behind my head. I'm the thing in itself. <laughs> Same difference. Yes and no. We lie on our backs. Mira always already nestled between us and contemplate the darkening sky for a spell. Orbiting satellites blink here and there on the brink of perception. The buried sutures that hold this world together dissolve almost inaudibly beneath us. A traveling cloud slowly unravels its various designs, ex unibus plurum, overhead. Look, I say, a portable stairway. No, it's a pony, Daddy. A sea pony, to be exact. Get real, says my wife. It's an old-fashioned lamp with a genie coming out. See there? She points upward. He's taking a bow. Is it just me? Or does he bear a passing resemblance to a particular someone I know? Every cloud looks like Chen, I sigh, sooner or later. I meant you, my wife sighs. Summer, Mira sighs. The cloud passes on. Indifference itself, filling up forms. There's nothing like it. Thanks. Thank you all for coming.